So, what? Take survival! Worry, anxiety, phobias, and panic attacks. Everyone worries and feels tense at times. You get that scared feeling in your stomach, your heart beats faster, your mouth goes dry, your thoughts race and you want to go to the loo. Sometimes you can shake and feel sick. It's good if you can use these feelings to give you an edge, but if they get too much it can make you mess up. If something like this happens to you, then it can make you even more worried that it's going to happen again. Different people have different levels of anxiety. This can be because of the personality type, or that they've had bad experiences in their life, or that they've just been taught to worry. You can learn to feel anxious and scared about life from your family. Children pick up on their parents' level of worry. If they see the world as a scary and hostile place, then it's likely that their children will as well. There are certain things that will make you more likely to be anxious. Drinking too much caffeine in coffee and energy type drinks. Eating too much sugar. Eating junk food. Not getting enough regular rest. Regularly drinking too much alcohol. Taking certain drugs. Working too hard. Being in a situation that you have little or no control over. There are also ways of thinking and feeling that increase it. If you're a perfectionist and feel that you're not allowed to fail, this may come from inside or from other people or the situation you're in. If you feel you must exercise a lot of control over your behaviour, then the constant self-monitoring can be exhausting. If you're a natural carer or rescuer, then taking on the control and responsibility for someone else's situation can be very stressful. The symptoms of anxiety and worry can be lessened by relaxation techniques such as breathing more deeply, clenching all your muscles in your body, holding in and then relaxing them. There are also mental techniques you can try where you replace distressing negative thoughts with positive, peaceful or funny ones. It's good if you can work out exactly what it is you're feeling anxious about. Sometimes it's not always obvious. There are basically two types of problems we have. Things that we have some control over and things that we don't. It's important to realise which is which. Some problems can be a mixture of both. You may have heard of the serenity prayer. Part of it goes, God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things that I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Things you can control. Prepare for whatever it is you're going to do, or what you think may happen. Get as much information as possible, or practice doing certain things over and over again to get good at them. It's much healthier for you to turn that worry energy into action. Being better prepared will give you more confidence and will help you to be calm when you do whatever it is. Once you've done your preparation, then accept that you've done as much as you can. Relaxation and giving your mind and body a break is also part of preparation. Think of all the possible ways you could handle a problem and write them down. Try to detach your emotions and think of it as a practical task that's happening to somebody else. Which options would result in positive outcomes and which would result in negative ones? Be realistic about the problem and possible outcomes. When we worry, we tend to think in a doomy way. The medical term for this is catastrophic thinking. For instance, people who are anxious about going to the dentist tend to focus on any possible pain and predict that there will be lots of it. This makes them more anxious. But the actual pain may be much less than getting kicked in the shin, which would not be such a big worrying deal. The opposite of this is magical thinking, for instance, where people don't study for an exam thinking, ah, I'll be all right. Both catastrophic thinking and magical thinking are not real. Being realistic helps you deal with the actual practical problem rather than wasting energy with doom or fantasy. If you're worried about something, then talk to the relevant people. If it's an exam, talk to your teacher. If it's the dentist, then say you're anxious and try to work out an arrangement such as they will stop if you put your hand up. Most dentists are pretty good about this stuff as it makes their job easier if you're calm. Letting people know how you feel is a better way to deal with the situation than you skipping an appointment because you were scared and them thinking you just couldn't be bothered to turn up. Being informed gives everyone more understanding and control. Although some things can be very serious, most aren't life or death. So if you're worrying that you may mess up, remember that it won't be the end of everything. There'll always be other chances and ways to put things right. Most successful people failed many times in ways just like you before they worked it through. Things you can't control. If you have no control over something, then accept the fact. You've no other choice. Worrying is just wasted energy. When you go on an aeroplane, do you think your worrying will make any difference to the flight? Will it make the engines work better or keep the wings on? Nope. Concentrate on what you can control. In this case, distracting yourself from worrying thoughts. There are lots of things you can't control. This is not because you're weak or not clever enough. If people could control everything in the world, then nothing bad would happen and we'd all be happy. But life's not like that. When bad things happen, people look for a reason. 
They do this because they want to find out if there was any way they could have exercised more control and prevented it. This is one of the reasons why people blame others or themselves. But sometimes it's no one's fault. It just is. Worry, anxiety and control are closely linked. When we know we can control something, or can realistically predict how it will turn out, then we tend not to worry so much. Although others can tell you not to worry about something, it often doesn't help. You have to make a decision not to worry. The problem is that feeling anxious and worrying is not something we can totally control with our head. It's mostly an emotional response. What you can do is learn techniques that help reduce that response. How to lessen the effects of worrying. Although everyone does it, going over and over stuff in your head when you're in bed at night doesn't usually sort things out. Your brain is tired and things can seem much bigger than they really are in the daytime. Also it will make you more tired for tomorrow and less able to sort things out. Get plenty of rest. Do the things you have to during the day and early evening, but leave yourself an hour to relax before you go to bed. Cut out stimulants like tea, coffee, caffeine drinks and cigarettes. Do not use alcohol to relax you as it will make you depressed and stop you getting a good night's sleep. Avoid junk food. Exercise. It makes your brain work better and releases happy chemicals. Keep things in proportion. If you're worrying a lot, then balance it out by spending time doing stuff you enjoy. Don't believe everything you read about in the newspapers. For instance, people worry more about crime and getting mugged than it actually happens. Many teenagers think that their parents worry too much about them. Older people worry because they know more about the world and more about what can go wrong. It's the same that you worry more about stuff than a five-year-old does. In certain situations, it's good to be cautious, but also be realistic. Phobias. A phobia is a strong fear that seriously affects how you live your life. People have phobias about all sorts of things, being outside, being closed in, heights, dogs, cats, spiders, germs, anything. You should not feel embarrassed or stupid about having a phobia. It's a recognised medical condition. Although they may be hard for others to understand, this doesn't give them the right to laugh or dismiss your real fear. Having a phobia is not fun. A common phobia is a fear of spiders, arachnophobia. People who don't have this will probably tell you that the spider is tiny compared to you, it can't do any harm, and it's probably more frightened of you. Although your mind knows this is true, it can be very hard to stop your fear response. This is because a phobia is an emotional reaction. About 10 million people in the UK have a phobia. Some phobias can affect your lifestyle more than others. People with the fear of spiders may just have to get someone to check the bathroom before they go in. People who are afraid of going outside, agoraphobia, may have a very restricted life in they can't get to the shops, have a social life, or even get out of their front door without feeling terrified. Phobias are usually treated by cognitive behavioural therapy. This is where your ways of thinking and behaviour are altered. One of the techniques is called graduated exposure. To take the example of spiders, a person with this fear is first shown a drawing or a photograph of a spider. They are asked to rate their feelings of anxiety and fear from 1 to 10. The counsellor then gets them to continue to look at the picture while practising relaxation techniques like breathing slowly. They might have to take the picture away for a while if the person's fear rating is getting too close so they can calm down a bit. This is then repeated until the person can look at the picture and keep their anxiety levels low. They then move on to a plastic toy spider or model of a spider. They go through the same process again. Next, they use a dead or alive spider in a glass case. In the final sessions, they encourage the person to handle a spider. If someone is afraid of going outside, then the graduated exposure is to get them to slowly, over time, go further and further from their house until they can go to where they want to. Graduated exposure is a very successful way of treating phobias. What causes a phobia? Some phobias are thought to be hardwired into our brain from cavemen days, like spiders, snakes, heights and loud noises. Other phobias could be triggered by a traumatic event in someone's life. For instance, if you're involved in a car crash, then you may get very scared of getting into a car again, or in any form of travel. Or a phobia can develop because someone is very stressed and focuses that stress onto some object, activity or place, and then avoids it as a way of controlling their stress. Panic attacks. Everyone is used to noticing symptoms from their body. For instance, if your stomach hurts, then you'll probably think it's maybe something you ate, or that you pulled a muscle. If you feel dizzy, it could be that you've not eaten properly, or are very tired, or have just stood up too quickly. So when a person gets symptoms of a fast heartbeat, feels that they can't breathe, they shake, their legs go wobbly, and they can't focus, it's understandable that they're convinced that something is really wrong with their body. But all of these are classic symptoms of a panic attack, a fear attack. No more, no less. 
What happens is that worry and anxiety, which the person may or may not be aware they're feeling, triggers their body to respond in certain physical ways. The person focuses on these physical symptoms and gets scared. This causes the body to react even more in that way. The more frightened the person becomes, the more their body reacts and a panic spiral happens. The two most common things that people fear in a panic attack is that they'll have a heart attack or they'll stop breathing. This will not happen. You will not die of a panic attack. You are less likely to die while having one than at any other time. Despite what your mind and body is telling you, if you remain calm, it will pass. You may feel terrified, but it will pass. It's all to do with an instinctive protection system called the fight or flight response. This is a programming that instantly puts your body into red alert mode so all your systems are primed and ready to defend yourself from something or to run away. The system kicks in without you even having to think about it. The response increases your heart and breathing rates, sends more blood to the brain so you can think more quickly, and sends blood to the muscles so they can move fast. It shuts down any system that it doesn't need to use at the moment, like your digestion. You probably experienced it when you're lying in bed half asleep and you hear some noise. Your body triggers awake before your mind realises what's going on. When you know that there's no real danger, your body then reverses all these changes. In a panic attack, the fight or flight response kicks in even though there's no real threat. The body systems are sped up and then the other side of the response tries to slow the body systems back down again. This is why a person can have symptoms of heart and breathing rates getting faster and slower, legs and arms shaking because they're being told to tense up and relax, and going dizzy because the amount of blood flowing to the brain keeps changing. These symptoms frighten them, which increases the speed up response. After someone has had a panic attack, they often become worried that it will happen again. This is not surprising as a panic attack can be very scary. Unfortunately, this worry makes it more likely that it will happen again, only because they've wound themselves up about it. People can also associate the place it happened with a panic attack. For instance, if it happened on a bus or in a supermarket, then they may avoid those things in case it causes another attack. This may help for the moment, but avoidance will make the condition worse. By associating it with a place or thing, it turns them into a fear situation. Therefore, when the person is near that place or thing again, it triggers a panic attack. Some people with agoraphobia who have used avoidance end up with not being able to even leave their bedroom. Avoidance teaches the person that panic attacks are caused by things on the outside. The reality is that they're an internal process and this can be treated. Treatment. There are two things to sort out. How to control the attacks when they happen and how to keep relaxed so they don't happen again. Your doctor may prescribe lorazepam, which is a short acting tranquilizer, to calm down your mood. You may also be given an antidepressant as these lower your stress levels and anxiety is often associated with depression. Once the antidepressants have kicked in after about two weeks, the doctor will stop the lorazepam as you may become dependent on it. The doctor may refer you to have cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, to try to change your thinking patterns to more positive ones and to undergo exposure therapy. What to do in a panic attack? All of these things may be hard to do in the middle of one, but try as best you can. Try to ignore all of your body symptoms. Your body is much better than you at sorting itself out. Keep as calm as you can and ignore any awful thoughts. Despite what you're feeling, believe that nothing bad will happen. You're just going to feel crap for a while, but it will pass. Breathe deeply and slowly. Tense up all your muscles, hold it for 10 seconds and then relax. Repeat if needed. Distract yourself by doing other things. Try talking to people, watch TV, listen to music, etc. Anything that stops you concentrating on your symptoms. You find that when you do this, the symptoms go down as you're not fueling them with doomy thoughts. Thinking about sex or food is a powerful distraction, unless of course you're anxious about sex or food. Do things that make you laugh. It releases tension and makes your brain produce happy chemicals. Crying also releases tension. Getting angry can help because it channels the fight part of the response. Punch a pillow, yell or swear your head off. Get a support group. This can just be your friends who you see or call up. Be aware of relying on just one person as your safe person. This puts pressure on them and it avoids the real internal issue. Sometimes just knowing you have people at the end of the phone can be enough to stop you panicking. Write a list of the bad things you were thinking when you were having an attack. Then write a list of the things you think and feel when you are calm. When you next have an attack, read them. This way you can just see that you're just having these bad thoughts again and that they will pass. This helps you look at yourself from the outside and so not to connect too much with what's happening inside. 
You'll probably notice that in an attack, the symptoms come in waves, getting bigger and bigger, and then smaller and smaller. You can do a type of distraction exercise, which is thinking of the symptoms out of 1 to 10, 10 being really panicking. This feedback can be good when you feel the waves getting smaller. Learning that you can control an attack is a major step. This lowers your general level of anxiety, which makes an attack less likely to happen. It also helps to make an attack less severe, because you know you can slow them down. This will break the panic loop. What to do if you're with someone having a panic attack? Even though you may not understand it and can see nothing wrong, appreciate that they're very frightened and feeling helpless. Keep telling them over and over that nothing bad will happen and that the feelings will pass. Try to distract their thoughts. Do not try to kick them out of it by telling them that they're stupid, weak or must pull out of it. This will not help. They're already under enough internal pressure and if they could pull out of it, they definitely would. If they want to go outside, inside or want to get off the bus, etc, then go with them. Don't leave them alone as they may just worry themselves into a spiral. Don't be surprised if they need to go to the loo or to be sick. Be aware that they may be embarrassed at having an attack in front of you or others and so may try to hide it. Look for the signs and reassure them. Also be aware that as they're very stressed, they may be very bitchy or angry. It's not them though, it's the panic. Be aware that they can be extremely exhausted after having an attack. Their body has been running on full alert for a while and has burned up a lot of energy. Eating something would be a good idea. Relaxation techniques. Breathing slowly and deeply. Repeat the word peace slowly over and over in your head as you breathe in. Choose any word that works for you. Imagine yourself in a calm place, for instance, on a warm sunny beach, in a field or floating down a river. Picture it in your head as realistically as you can. Imagine all the sounds and smells. It doesn't matter where you are or what time it is, you can just zone out in your head. Listen to soft chill out music. Use incense. Lavender is very calming, but choose one that's right for you. If your mind keeps wandering, don't get stressed out. Stay calm and just try to gently focus on the relaxation technique. Panic attacks tend to come for a while and then go away. This may be because things change in your lifestyle, thinking patterns or some other cause. Realise that during an attack and in the long term, they will pass. This podcast is one of the 187 subjects covered in So What? Teen Survival an ebook downloadable from Amazon.